Recording in progress. Hello, um, welcome to our webinar today, actually your webinar, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Amelia Cook, Breast Service Manager at uh, King Edward VII Hospital, um, and our breast service is, is very dear to us. Um, and I'd like to introduce our wonderful colleagues um, who bring integrative care uh, central to your care and to raise the quality of life for all of those individuals um, being diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, to get the right care for you, um, integrative care is so important. Um, we're, we're blessed today with having um, Anjana Kulkarni, uh, genetics consultant, um, Jenny Earle, specialist uh, physiotherapist. We've got Ashley Jordan, who's lead specialist physiotherapist and lymphedema expert. Um, and myself, who is going to be talking through um, micropigmentation as well as holistic therapies. And I think it's important to say that all therapies starting before as early as possible helps recovery and, and restoration moving forward and gives you the ability to uh, be able to feel confident about choosing options for care and, and um, getting support for your needs. Um, so we empower you, so my lights have gone out, we aim to empower you um, at the start. Um, we have on the breast unit at King Edward VII um, wonderful clinical nurse specialists, we have um, brilliant radiologist consultants. We also have psychologists, um, we have a pain or comfort management specialist, as we like to say. Um, we have a holistic uh, therapist who does Reiki and uh, hypnotherapy and gives you the tools to feel positive about what's happening. Um, breast care nurses is aimed to empower and, and give you those options, choices and confidence. And then we also have a psychologist. Um, we seem to be having a dietitian as well who will help with um, health promotion. Um, also, our physio team are fantastic in seeing you before any treatment, during and afterwards, and the same with all the treatments that we're speaking about today. Um, having that knowledge and having the choices um, is essential. Um, so if I start off with micropigmentation, um, it's a service that we can empower. We empower before surgery, particularly if you're going to have um, uh, immediate breast reconstruction um, and having that choice of, of seeing how it can look, how it will look and what your choices are afterwards. Micropigmentation is um, a semi-permanent colouring um, device that implants colour to create the appearance um, of a nipple areola complex as sometimes they need to be taken away for your safety. Um, and they can look very realistic. Um, the reconstructions are amazing with our, our brilliant plastic surgeons. It looks so natural and, and often women coming for mammograms in future, uh, the mammographers can't quite tell which one is, is uh, real and yours, actually they're both yours after reconstruction and we just make it look as, as good as possible. Your body image is central to um, giving you confidence and, and we give you all the options to be able to choose certain things. Um, so the timing of it as well, there's no limitations. You may feel that you want a, a nipple reconstruction um, with micropigmentation uh, three to six months after surgery, or you may feel that actually 20 years later, you might think, hey, I, maybe I'll have this done. It, and it's really for what that individual feels is their right time. Um, I know one lady recently who uh, was going to have it done last year and then she felt that she shouldn't for some reason. Um, you shouldn't feel guilty at all. I think she felt that she shouldn't have any procedures done. Um, and then thought about it, thought, no, I want this done for me. Um, another lady whose daughter has grown up and left home, she suddenly thought, no, I, I want to feel more confident, 
this is right for me now. So it's really up to you. No, no time constraints or limitations. Um, the actual procedure itself only takes an hour. So you can do that in your lunch hour. You can go back to work afterwards. Um, it's in the comfort of a, a clinical room with people you know, and you share that experience together with choosing colors. Um, if you've had a bilateral uh, mastectomy and reconstruction, um, you can start from scratch and think, what color would I like to be? Um, or it, it's about matching that color up to your own uh, nipple areola color. Um, and you work through that together uh, and work out the best colors uh, to match the best and, and giving you that confidence. Um, you will feel comfortable in a clinic setting on a, um, a bed um, where if you, most women don't tend to have feeling on that skin area or surface. Sometimes you do, and if that's the case, we can put a numbing cream on um, or take it at your own pace. Uh, others don't feel it at all. So it, it, we can work that out together as we're going along. There's always backup um, to support that comfort level. Um, it's usually done in about three goes. Um, you have the first treatment um, of tattooing that takes about an hour. Uh, it is essentially a tattoo. It goes millimeters under the skin um, and is a semi-permanent tattoo. We find that that's better uh, with light reflection um, and it just doesn't look as solid. It looks more natural that way. Usually you need top ups every 18 months or so just to keep things looking fresh. Um, and usually it takes three attempts in the first um, go just to get the desired result. Um, and that's what we do together until you feel happy, until you feel confident, until we've got the gold standard look for you. Um, giving you the confidence is what we aim to achieve with this treatment. Um, happy to take many questions afterwards about it um, and I'll see if I can help with anything further. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to pass you over to uh, Jenny, who's our specialist physiotherapist, um, and she'll be delighted to tell you a little bit more about her service. Hi there. Um, yes, so thanks, Amelia. Um, my name's my name's Jenny, and uh, alongside my colleague Ashley, who's going to have a little chat with you um, after I've spoken to you about. Um, physiotherapy following breast cancer surgery. Um, physiotherapy can help after breast cancer surgery to prevent long-term problems with shoulder movements, help improve posture and support your return to function, activities and sport. Um, we can treat and improve symptoms that could be caused by tight scars and cording. We can contribute to relieving and controlling any discomfort. Um, and of course, we can help reduce the risk and treat lymphedema, which my colleague Ashley will talk about shortly. Um, a lack of shoulder movement after surgery can lead to stiffness, pain and weakness. And we can help by giving you a range of movement um, by giving you exercises which can maintain circulation to ensure adequate nutrition to your joints um, and can prevent shortening and weakness of the surrounding muscles. Um, we start these exercises normally um, as we see you on the ward post-operatively um, and it's important that we monitor you and, and keep an eye on your progress, A, because these exercises might vary depending on the surgery that you have, um, and B, each individual is different, which we'll keep going back to. It is that individualised patient-centred approach. People ha have different starting points. Um, people have different lifestyles. People might have a history of shoulder problems, which can actually lead to a greater risk of developing shoulder problems following your surgery. So uh, we start you on very low level exercises in the early stage, often below shoulder height, but then we'll see you in our outpatient clinic to move you forward and help you progress, um, depending on how you're healing and how things are going for you. 
as you go through your journey, as we start to regain range of movement in the shoulder or maintain range of movement in the shoulder, we can start to introduce strengthening exercises, which of course is really important to support your return to function. Um, so we can safely guide you with regards to timings and loads and progressions um, that are safe for you after your surgery. Um, we can also support your return to, um, to, to general exercise. Being active can really help you feel better in yourself. It can reduce your feelings of worry. Um, it can help with tiredness and fatigue and can help you sleep better. Um, and we're really mindful of your potential fluctuating energy levels. And we can work with you to find a way of incorporating exercise into your recovery that involves rest and pacing. Um, and again, we take that individualized approach that consider your levels of fitness and lifestyle. Tight scars and cording can also limit your shoulder range of movement and contribute to pain and discomfort. So I'll just tell you a little bit about cording. Um, so cording can sometimes develop as a side effect of surgery following breast cancer surgery, particularly to your lymph nodes. If you develop cording, you'll be able to see and, and or feel one or a few rope-like structures under the skin of your inner arm, which often starts near the site of the scar in the underarm region and extends down the arm to the elbow and even sometimes to the wrist and even sometimes down into the chest wall. Cords tend to be painful and tight, not always, but it can, they can make it difficult for you to lift your arm up high, which can be particularly problematic, especially if you need to achieve upper limb positions during radiotherapy. No one is really sure what causes cording. Um, it may happen when lymph vessels which carry lymph fluid become hardened. Um, and more research is needed before we know for sure what the cords are made of. In addition, we're not yet certain how many people will go on to develop cording um, and find that cording typically occurs anywhere from several days to several weeks, even sometimes to months after your surgery. It, if we suspect cording, um, we encourage gentle stretching and continued use of the arm rather than avoiding activity. Um, and we can also treat the cords with, a, with gentle massage techniques. And actually on that note as well, we can also use gentle massage techniques and manual therapy to treat scars that may be sticking to underlying tissues and use touch as a way to help manage altered sensations and any apprehension that you might have or experience around using the arm following your surgery. So I'm now I'm now going to pass you on to um, Ashley, who will spend some time talking to you about lymphedema. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so today I'm just going to explain a little bit about lymphedema, about what lymphedema is, how physio can help, and some general tips for preventing it. So to understand lymphedema, I thought it was important just to understand a little bit more about the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is a network of channels and glands through the body that carry a clear lymph fluid. It forms part of our immune system and helps us to fight infection and remove excess fluid. When that lymphatic system isn't functioning properly, it causes swelling in the body's tissues and th that chronic swelling is what we know as lymphedema. It does affect, it affects around two in 10 people with breast cancer. Um, the reason patients may develop lymphedema is because during breast surgery, some or all of the lymph nodes under the arm may be removed. This can disrupt the flow of the lymph fluid and cause lymphedema. So it's been found that the risk of lymphedema is often higher in, um, higher within the patients where there's been more lymph nodes removed. In addition, radiation treatments to the lymph nodes under the arm can cause some scarring and um, blockages to the lymph vessels that can also increase your risk of lymphedema. It can happen anytime after surgery or radiation to the lymph nodes um, and the risk will continue for the rest of, of that person's life. It can't be cured but we're there in physio to help to help manage um, the lymphedema. 
So the main thing we say to look out for after surgery is a swelling in all or part of your arm. It could be one arm or it could be both arms. You may have, you might notice the arm feels heavy, there's a new ache into the arm. And we also just say to watch out for difficulty fitting into clothes, checking whether watches or jewelry feel tight on wrists or fingers. Um, if that's the case, we ask you to get in touch with your breast care nurse or physio, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring you in to, to have a look at some treatment options. Treatment does depend on how severe the lymphedema is. Um, and it's important for patients to have an assessment and form a treatment plan with, with a specialist physiotherapist. Treatments that, we, treatments that we do for lymphedema, we include for lymphedema, firstly, exercise. So as Jenny mentioned in physio, exercise is it's very dependent on the individual and the individual goals and needs, but will guide you generally on gentle upper limb movements to encourage lymph drainage. We tailor it to, we tailor it to you um, and your, your goals and your previous level of fitness. One of the other techniques we use is manual lymphatic drainage. So it's a light skin stretching massage that helps promote the movement of lymphatic fluid out of that swollen limb. We, we will treat you regularly for manual lymphatic drainage, but we also aim to teach you self-management techniques. So it's something you can do at home and it's something that people find really useful. Um, so we'll teach you manual lymphatic drainage and we teach manual lymph node clearance. So the, the best way to do this is um, placing a ball under the arm and we get you just to do gentle squeezes just to encourage the, the fluid out of, that, out of that arm at regular intervals alongside some physio treatment. Um, we'll also discuss education and ways to prevent lymphedema and positioning. So for example, we recommend keeping the arm comfortably raised at points to help drain some of the fluid. Um, there, that's kind of the main things we treat in physio, but with there are there are some other treatment options, and we'll guide you on those alongside the breast care nurses. Um, so things like bandaging, wearing a compression sleeve or elastic bandage can help to move fluid and prevent the buildup of fluid. It's not something we give you in physio, but we can certainly help refer you on and and have a chat to Amelia as well. Um, and diet and weight management as well. So we know that eating a healthy diet is an important part of treatment. And as Amelia mentioned, hopefully we're gonna be having a look at nutrition as part of the, uh, the team as well. So the last thing is just some tips on preventing lymphedema. So we know that poor drainage of the lymphatic system can cause the affected arm to be at high risk of infection. So it's really important that we reduce the risk of infection on the side that you've had any lymph node clearance. We recommend you avoid injections, blood tests um, on the affected arm, have them done in the other arm instead. We ask that you take uh, care of your, good care of your fingernails, using a clean razor while shaving under the arm. Um, it's important also that you clean the skin of the affected arm daily, making sure you dry it well. Um, and it can be a good idea to protect the arm by using gloves when gardening or strong household cleaners. If you do get any cuts uh, to, the, to the arm, clean them with soap and water and apply your antibacterial ointment with a sterile dressing. And it's really important that you act quickly and just inform your doctor right away if you've got any signs of infection. So that's redness, pain, heat, increased swelling or fever. We also recommend that blood pressure tests are done on the unaffected arm and that you try and avoid wearing clothing with tight bands or elastic cuffs, and that's because they can affect further drainage of the fluid. Um, the arm can also be less sensitive to extreme temperature. So we ask that you avoid extreme hot or cold temperatures on the affected arm. That's things like saunas, hot tubs, heating pads, ice packs. Um, the other thing is to avoid, we recommend you take care of vigorous or repetitive movements against resistance, such as scrubbing, pushing, pulling the arm, in your initial weeks post-surgery and try and carry a handbag or heavy packages with the unaffected arm. However, long-term, it is important to look after your body by exercising regularly. So research has shown that cardiovascular and weight training are actually beneficial in preventing lymphedema. So it's just important that, it's just important that we're making you aware that yes, we need to avoid and be careful with those movements, but it doesn't mean that you, you're not using the arm to get back to your daily life long term and um, we'll help we'll help guide you through that
Thank you. So um, I think it's my turn now. Thanks, Ashley, Jenny, Media. Um, so I'm Anju Kulkarni. I'm a consultant clinical geneticist. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of genetic testing for breast cancer. So uh, in terms of genetic testing, the field has evolved hugely over the last decade or two. Um, many of you may be familiar or have heard of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which um, really there's been a growing awareness of, particularly since Angelina Jolie gave her announcement that she carried a BRCA1 gene back in 2013. But that growing awareness within the public, within the clinical arena as well, is really driving forward genetic testing. And um, we're now in a position to offer genetic testing much more quickly and, and at a cheaper cost than we did before. So whereas a few decades ago, it would have taken years really to sequence and look at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. We're now in a position where we can test genes in a much shorter period of several weeks rather than months or years. So what that means is that um, eligibility or the availability of genetic testing for women with breast cancer has really grown. And, um, and without a doubt, alongside all of the advances in genetic testing, we've been able to uh, demonstrate that actually knowledge of somebody's genetic status with regard to their breast cancer can guide treatment decisions as well, which I'll come on to, but also help guide um, management for the family members as well. So when we're thinking about genetics in general for cancer, most cancers, most breast cancer is not an inherited form of breast cancer. And that is a really key message that I want to get across. Most breast cancer is what we call sporadic. Now, cancer is by its very nature a genetic disease, but that doesn't mean that it's inherited gene changes that are causing the cancer. Most of the changes in the genes that are causing a cancer are non-inherited and are specific to that particular cancer cell. So actually only about three up to 5% of all breast cancers are due to an underlying inherited, what we call mutation or variant in the gene a disease causing variant. So actually the vast majority of breast cancer, you, you wouldn't be concerned about risks in the future or risks for family members. So how do we identify people who do have an inherited form of breast cancer or maybe at risk of an inherited form of breast cancer? Well, there are several red flags that we need to think about. Firstly, anyone diagnosed at a young age, particularly premenopausal breast cancer, but particularly those diagnosed under the age of 40 with breast cancer, any woman who's been diagnosed with breast cancer that is affecting both breasts, bilateral breast cancer, particularly under the age of 50, that again is a bit of a suspicious sign that there might be something inherited. And then if there's clustering of breast cancer in the family, so close relatives with breast cancer um, or close relatives with related cancers. So we know that in families where there is an inherited mutation, we might see um, other types of cancer in the family, such as ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. And these can all be signs that perhaps genetic testing will be a benefit in the family. Now, some women may have more than one type of cancer. They may have been diagnosed with breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Again, that, that is a sign that potentially genetic testing will be helpful. And also we know that in some um, communities and in, with uh, individuals with certain ancestry, there might be a higher prevalence of certain mutations in, the in, in that community. So, for example, in the Ashkenazi Jewish community, there is a higher prevalence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations. So if a woman has breast cancer and has Jewish ancestry, then that is an important thing for us to be considering for her as well. So when we're thinking about um, the benefits of genetic testing, it's really important to bear in mind that whereas previously we used to think about genetic testing after somebody's diagnosis, further down the line perhaps, or for women who maybe had a family history of breast cancer, um, really what we're in the position to be able to offer now is testing at the point of diagnosis or early on in a woman's treatment for those that we think there might be a, a high suspicion of a, a, a mutation. And we can offer that testing to guide surgical decision making um, and also to guide chemotherapy decisions and targeted therapy, drug therapies as well. Um, what we know is that women who do carry a mutation, say the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes or other genes that can be linked to breast cancer risk, and there are other genes that we can test for now, that they may 
So if they've had a diagnosis of breast cancer, they may have a, a, a higher risk of developing a new cancer in the future. So this is not in relation to recurrence of the previous breast cancer at all, but actually a risk of developing a new primary breast cancer. That risk is elevated compared with a woman who doesn't have a mutation. And because of that, some women may decide that they want to opt for more extensive surgery at the time of their breast cancer treatment if they carry a mutation or further down the line. And it's an incredibly personal decision whether a woman chooses to have breast conserving surgery if she carries a mutation or have a bilateral mastectomy, which is removal of healthy breast tissue as well. And it's an incredibly personal decision that genetic counsellors, geneticists like myself, can help guide women through. And of course, their, their oncology teams and the CNS team as well. In terms of prevention, we know that some, as I say, of these genes are, are associated with risks of other types of cancer. So we do need to consider what future risks might be for that particular individual if they carry a mutation, but also thinking about risks for the wider family, because if we find an inherited mutation, it does mean that other members of the family might be at risk of carrying the same mutation. And we can then offer them preventative strategies mm -hmm. and extra surveillance or surgical options to reduce their risk. It's important to bear in mind that when we're thinking about inheritance of these mutations, you can inherit mutations from either side of the family. There is a, a misconception sometimes that mutations can only be inherited from the maternal line, from the mother's side of the family, but that's not true at all. You can inherit these mutations from either side of the family. It's just that men who carry mutations tend to have the lower risks of cancer, and so it may not be manifesting or you may not see cancer on that branch of the family. Um, and it only comes to light when perhaps their daughter is affected with breast cancer. So it is really important to look at the structure of the family um, when you're thinking about testing as well. I think it's, it, it can't be underestimated how powerful and empowering genetic testing can be for women because it does allow them to make decisions about their treatment and management plan, but also gives them some um, relief from uncertainty because ultimately a lot of the time the main question people have is why me why has this happened to me and sometimes genetic testing can give you an answer sometimes it doesn't give an answer though and there can be limitations of testing sometimes and um, vast majority of the time actually we offer genetic testing and we don't find an underlying genetic cause even though there appears to be a susceptibility in the family or even though the patient's been diagnosed at a young age there are many factors that influence our risk of developing breast cancer, and genetics is only one element of that. There are hormonal factors, environmental factors, and other factors, genetic factors, that we're not really in a position to really know about yet. We have 20,000 different genes, and we only know of a handful of genes that can be linked to breast cancer risk. So it's likely that there are other genetic factors that we will learn more about over the forthcoming decade or so. I think just to finally end, it, I think the important thing is if you're worried about the possibility of an inherited risk for your breast cancer or an inherited risk in the family, do seek advice, do question it and do explore it. You may well be reassured by your clinicians or by your oncology team that actually genetic testing is not needed and that in itself is, is very powerful for, for families, but it, it's, it, it is important to explore that and to make sure that you have the appropriate genetic counselling and support both before you have the test and after the test to help guide you and the family in decision making. I think that was all I wanted to say, Amelia. Thank you ever so much, all of you. Um, I think we're inviting questions now. So please do let us know if we can help with anything. There's some questions in the panel uh, in the chat a uh, quick QA, Amelia. Ah, yes. So, um, one question is Where is King Edward VII Hospital? Um, I could help with that one. It's um, in well, Beaumont Street, central London, so in near to Harley Street and Marlebone. Um, we're there. 
Uh, and just micropigmentation for me. Um, can you get micropigmentation on any type of scar tissue? It's a good question. Um, if you've got scarring around often where um, there's been either nipple reconstruction or reconstruction, um, you can go over the scar with the colour. Sometimes the colour doesn't take as well on the scar. Sometimes the scar can be beneficial because it, it, it creates that perhaps depth and that uneven skin tone of, of the areola. Um, sometimes we can try a bit of dry needling if it's a young scar um, to try and thin that out, but we can certainly go over and some scars do take the colour. Shall I take the next question? Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm two years post-surgery, but still have stiffness around my shoulder. Can I come to your physio, even though I had my surgery on the NHS a while back? Of course you can. Um, we we would love to see you. And, and certainly, um, as, as with any any physio appointment, we, we start off by asking you a number of questions and find out about your history um, and then have a look at your movements. Um, it might be that your shoulder stiffness isn't related to breast cancer surgery any longer, but but we absolutely have the capacity to 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 treat your shoulder stiffness within our clinics, um, without a doubt. Did you want to add anything to that, Ashley? No, not. To, I mean, that's it. yeah, that's exactly right. You can you can come and see us at any point in your journey, whether it's um, before surgery, whether it's after surgery 10, 20 years down the line. Um, it doesn't matter if your surgery was on the NHS or private, um, you're welcome to, to self-refer to the King Edwards physio team. Um, the email to do that is uh, physiosecretary at kingedwardvii.co.uk. Um, we're happy to answer any queries, even if you want to just have a, an initial chat over the phone or Zoom, um, just to see if, if, if we're the right place for you. In terms of lymphedema, I think um, with the next question, is waxing safe rather than shaving? Um, that's an interesting one, isn't it? And it's a bit uh, of a grey area. Um, we all like to make sure that we're <laughs> nice and clean down there with the, with the shaving or the waxing or cream. Which, whichever, I suppose waxing might be a bit hot, um, and we should try and avoid in regards to if you've had an auxiliary clearance or all of your lymph nodes removed, hot wax on that area. Shaving gently is usually okay. Often a electric shaver apparently is a little bit safer. Um, and cream, what, what do you think, Ashley? Yeah, um, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's a very gray area, isn't it? The, the main thing is it's just that it's preventing mm. infection. Um, with shaving, I think you're more at risk of breaking the skin and causing a potential infection. But it, yeah, it's a it's a grey area. I think as long as you take care and keep the area clean, dry, try and prevent um, any cuts to the area. That that that's as much as you can do. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll take the next one. So um, the next question is with genetic testing. What happens if the family member tests positive for the gene? What is the treatment or the prevention options other than surgery? So I'm assuming that when what that means is if the family, if your family member tests positive for a gene mutation, then you um, are able to have testing, close relatives are able to have testing for that specific mutation that's been found in the family. Um, and there would be, depending on how closely related they are to the family member that had genetic testing, we would be able to guide you on the likelihood that you carry the same mutation. In terms of um, treatment or prevention options other than surgery, um, we, we would offer surveillance, breast surveillance to any woman who has um, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation. Um, that there is national guidance around that and we start the screening from 30. For some women, we start at 25, depending on how strong their family history is. Um, and that's annual MRI scans in, in a woman's 30s. Then we add in mammograms in the 40s. And then from 50, it's mammograms only, depending on the breast tissue density. 
And, and then for some um, women as well, we can offer um, chemo prevention, it's called all drugs like tamoxifen um, to reduce the risk or, or depending on if women are postmenopausal, drugs like mm -hmm. letrozole and raloxifene that can be used to um, reduce the risk of developing breast cancer, but generally the ones that are hormonally driven breast cancer, those mm -hmm. drugs would be useful as well. Um, is there an age limit for genetic testing? So that's a very important question. So a lot of the genes that we're talking about have adult onset risks. We don't, um, there is probably only one breast cancer susceptibility gene that's incredibly rare, a gene called TP53, that is associated with earlier onset cancers, younger onset cancers. But most of the breast cancer genes are associated with breast cancer risks that start to rise in your late 20s, early 30s onwards at the earliest. Um, so we tend to suggest that genetic testing, if there's a mutation in the family, that we will offer testing in adulthood, so from 18 onwards. I think that's the question that was being asked, hopefully. Um, there's another couple of questions come up about lymphedema. So um, someone's asked, does lymphedema develop over time or suddenly? Um, it develops over time in a, in a sense, you you'll tend to notice that the arm feels, uh, there might be a new ache to the arm, it might feel heavy, you might notice the jewelry is getting a little bit tighter. And uh, that's the point at which you would, you would seek kind of help from breast care nurses or physio to take measurements of the arm and assess whether there is a difference between the two. Um, so in that sense, it develops over time. Um, you won't wake up one day and find that the arm is, you shouldn't wake up one day and find the arm is hugely swollen. It, it's going to be a, a, a progression. My main, um, my main advice is just to, to seek help early on. If um, uh, a cut happens or an injury or a bite that gets a bit swollen, um, that because the lymphatic fluid isn't quite as pure as it once was after the nodes have been removed, it can initiate a small infection in that area which can cause swelling. Um, on occasions. Uh, I think surgical techniques are so much more advanced than they used to be as well. And the risks of lymphedema have really gone down. Uh, at King Edward VII, we um, actually uh, do something called lympha, uh, which reconnects the, the blood vessels um, during, at the time of surgery, to reduce that even further, that risk. Um, if it does happen, it can happen like that, but it's still, we're here to try and minimise those risks and treat anything earlier um, to help with that, to help it stop developing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a, another question on lymphedema, which is how long after surgery can it manifest? It, that's it, it's, it's an impossible one to answer. It, it can be at any time. Um, it can be uh, from not too long after surgery to many years down the line. Line. So it's just important to, to look out for those signs and, as Amelia said, seek, um, seek advice and treatment early so we can help you manage it quickly. So um, how soon after surgery for lumpectomy can you do things like plank, downward dog, dead, um, lift weights, etc.? Um, yeah, the that varies a little bit as well. Yeah, <laughs> hence my my hesitation. Um, we we it depends on how you're recovering. Um, is is the simple answer, and I apologise if that does come across as being a, a little bit vague. Um, for example, I I may start some patients on very light we, we use a lot of resistance bands called therabands in, in physiotherapy and I might start a patient potentially at four weeks post-op on very low level resisted exercises depending on the surgery that they've had so if it if it's a lympha procedure for example we might be a lot more cautious or if they've had more significant reconstructive surgery we might be a little bit more cautious so it does very much depend on you your symptoms what range of movement you've already managed to achieve and then we would build up your strength over a period of time 
through graded, we can progress strength by, well, we have to overload in order to build strength and agility. We might be able to do that by increasing your resistance, by changing the way you do your exercises, by increasing your repetitions. And that will very, very much be individual. Um, ballpark, to get back to things like plank, downward dog, um, and lifting weights, so I'd, I'd probably go at least 12 weeks onwards. Do you agree, Ashley? Correct me if you think, if you think differently. Yeah, the thing not. thing is to get people back to feeling confident and doing normal things. Um, Absolutely. Just at various stages, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very, very much so. Yeah. And it depends on your previous levels of fitness as well. Yeah. Um, with, without a doubt. But but your your best bet is 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 to come in and see us so we can assess you and see and help you make those uh, help you make the right decisions for for when to get back safely, um, but but to empower you and allow you to be able to do that. Um, do you want me to take? Should I take this one and then Jenny? Yeah, can... I'll jump in if I need to. Uh, so I had a double mastectomy with immediate rebuild at the end of January. I now have a frozen shoulder and I've always had nerve pain. Any suggestions? Um, the answer is going to be a little bit vague again, like Jenny's. It, it, it is, we would have to assess you and have a look as to whether there's anything that's um, any stiffness lingering because of the double mastectomy or whether it is it's just a, a, a frozen shoulder not related to that or possibly related to that. Um, and then whether the nerve pain is related to that as well. Um, it completely depends on our assessment, but things we'd be looking at in physio are um, increasing your range of movement, either with manual techniques or through exercise, and then starting you on some um, strengthening exercises as well, if there's any weakness or imbalance. So my main suggestion is to, to seek assessment with, with uh, an MSK and, and breast specialist physio, um, and they'll be able to, to guide you from there. It's, it's very individual. Um, it depends on, on, on the assessment. So yes, we have all colours um, for micropigmentation for the individual. So from the darker skins to the lighter skins, um, we have colours that will blend for you as an individual. Um, we can work with, with any skin type. And then... The last question I think is if I am still in cancer treatment, can I get genetic testing or do I have to wait? So no, you don't at all need to wait. Um, if you are, if it's something you want to explore, it's important actually to explore it. I'd say different women want to think about genetic testing at different time points for themselves. And that's really where the genetic counselling comes into play because for some women, they want to complete all their cancer treatment before they start considering genetic testing and for other women they want all that information up front when they're planning their um, management with their oncology team so certainly if it's something you want to look into please do get in touch um, we have a cancer genetic service through king edwards um, in, in in the hospital as well um so yeah after suffering cording and frozen shoulder now on the mend great um, I still have some stiffness on my side. Um, and any advice on how to help? Um, I, again, I, we'd have to we'd have to have a have a look at you and see and see why you're experiencing um, that stiffness. And, and again, just just to to agree with, with what Ashley said earlier, it is it, it could be relating to your surgery. It might be something separate. Um, Although Ashley and I treat our, our breast patients, we're also musculoskeletal trained. So we're able to, to have a look at you from, from a post-surgical perspective, but also from a general musculoskeletal perspective. And hopefully with, with a thorough assessment, actually get to the bottom of why you're experiencing that pain on your flank and, um, and help you with an appropriate treatment plan. I think we're done there with the questions. So thank you so much for um, raising any. And also please contact us if, in the future if there's anything we can help with. Um, I think details will be on the webinar. 
Um, just to let you know, it's been recorded, um, so you'll be able to replay it if, if you've missed anything. Um, and we're here to help. So um, it, it's lovely to see you all. And, and thank you to the amazing team as well.